Our first speaker, um, I'm very happy to announce him, uh, Louis van Tilburg. He is, he was for many, many years uh, the senior researcher here at the museum. He is now our emeritus researcher uh, and emeritus professor uh, of art history, specializing in Van Gogh at the University of Amsterdam. He has published widely on Van Gogh and was jointly responsible for several exhibitions on the artist, including Van Gogh and Mie here in Amsterdam in 1988, so a long time ago, and also in Paris 1998, and the major survey of Van Gogh's paintings at the Van Gogh Museum in 1990. Um, and of course, also on the verge of insanity, Van Gogh and his illness, 2016, Van Gogh in Japan, uh, collaboration with three museums in Japan in 2017-18, and Van Gogh and the Olive Groves in Dallas and Amsterdam last year, um, and of course also the present exhibition. Um, I give the floor to Louis now, and I wish you a great symposium. Thank you. Today, as Nienke and Marije already said, is the moment to cast an eye on over the scholarly balance sheet of our exhibition. And the last exhibition that I made is, uh, is always the best exhibition that I ever made. So in Amsterdam, we still have two months of intense looking and thus sheer pleasure ahead of us. But the idea is to dwell now not only on the proposals in the essays or in the, of the catalogue, but also to expand on them. What did we overlook? What deserved closer attention? What is plainly open to question? After all, we, had, we all had the opportunity to increase our knowledge by studying by I, the 46, or is it 47, uh, uh, of, of Van Gogh's uh, uh, 74 paintings from Offer sur Oise, not only in detail, but also in relation to uh, one another. The reasons for organizing the exhibition were many folded, uh, but, many, uh, but one of the main uh, impetus of our many headed, but also hard headed team me included, was to rehabilitate his achievement of the last months of his life. It never reached the peaks of his years in Arl, uh, was the general idea. Detailed research was lacking, and in the catalogue we therefore tried to fill the gap. A great deal of work had thus been devoted to presenting, as Maria already told you, but presenting a firmly grounded proposal regarding the order in which the paintings uh, were ex executed. Considerable effort did likewise go into identifying all of the depicted locations and the nature involved. And there is an attempt also to understand the underlying psychological process of his decision to end his life. Furthermore, we try to understand all the works involved. Is his output different from the years before, and if so, why? Are there any mistakes in the catalogue? Yes, certainly. I have not heard anyone complaining aloud, but we have mistakenly described the straw-covered huts in, in, in Auvair right down to the, the titles in the Dutch publications as houses with reed rather than straw-thatched roofs. Extra painful since the artist himself was well aware of the difference between these two types. Here and there we erroneously state that the spring trees depicted in, in, um, in for example, In example, the staircase at Auvers uh, uh, sur Oise are uh, acacias, and this is all due to the traditional title of the painting in Stockholm. Um, however, this is not a specimen of the tropical acacia at all, but the pseudo-acacia, the Eastern European robinia, an entirely different spe species. In our daily speech, however, no distinction is made between the two, and hence the confusion. Small mistakes, you would think. But it brings me to a subject left virtually unaddressed in the catalogue, namely the titles of Auvair paintings. Historically, the relationship between titles and works of art is a complex one. But if we adopt Leo Hooke's opinion in his 19, 1978 informative The Titel uit de Doeken gedaan, the title on field, they were created in the 18th century for mainly commercial reasons to indicate and identify the titled painting with the purpose to entice um, the fewer to seduce him to into a desired interpretation of that work in question. These titles, however, were rarely original, that is, made up by the creator, and as such an ambiti ambitious and uncertain source of information. It's no different for the paintings in our exhibition. Only one work has an original title, Garden of Domini, which the artist puts himself on the canvas. It is a rather factual, descriptive title, similar to 
to the other rare titles chosen by Van Gogh for his most important paintings, such as The Potato Eaters, The, the Harvest, La Berceuse. When Andries Bonger began to, uh, make, to make an inventory of the works in Theo's collection in the late 1890s, and was thus the first to be compelled to provide titles for them, he, choose, he did choose comparable ones. Maison du Village, Hameau Près d'Auvert, this is the last one, to mention some random examples. Although this was not intentional, these descriptions of the depicted made it immediately clear that the maker of the works uh, did not belong to the traditional salon artists with their idealized scenes of a mythological, religious or historical past, but rather built on uh, the artistic legacy of the realists. They had paid particular attention to their own surroundings and thought highly of common day scenes, and from the titles used, the ideological position of the painter in the debate on the cause of modern art could easily be guessed. At the same time, such titles set him apart from more narrative-minded colleagues who favoured more anecdotal or literary descriptions. This ideological 19th century context naturally lost its value in the 20th century, after which art historical need to include factual correct information in titles started to prevail. In this way, the time-honored function of the title as an instrument to offer the viewer a starting point for interpretation was compromised even more uh, than before. Titles no, longer, uh, titles no longer seduced. After all, they recalled, they, they, after all, they really do annex works of art. And a strongly neutral description, for example, Houses et Offers Rouise, reduces the need to think and experience the artwork as something that is more than a mere re representation of a topographically known spot. To give an example, Van Gogh apparently had an interest in emphasizing that his painting of Dominique's garden was not an, a random garden, but an artist's garden, and hence the title. Why he depicted the garden, however, is not clear from the title. And searching for an answer, it occurred to me that he wanted to show that this French artist had not... Uh, that this French artist had not surrendered to the, and now I quote, whimsical mania which men make close their eyes against all surrounding objects and only deign to open them at 500 miles from home. End of quote. This was the thesis of the writer, journalist, editor and gardener, Alphonse Carr, in his inef in infinitely popular uh, Voyage autour de Mont Chardin, which Van Gogh had devoured in his early years. All truths of life could be found in one's environment, Carr believed. And he made this clear by studying nature in his garden from every angle and reporting on it in letters to a departed, adventurous and also fictitious friend elsewhere. As we all know, Van Gogh ignored this recommendation, but regrets bubbled up after two years in the south of France and especially his stay in the asylum. He longed again for a rooted existence in one native soil, and so no finer image than Dominique's garden in Auvergne to underline the necessity of such a return, I think. But if this is true, the question is whether we can come up with a title that does justice to this narrative, or shall I call it sentiment? I don't know. Difficult. It seems more easy in other cases. A narrative is also hidden, for example, in the painting now called Tree Roots. Oh. Um, uh, which we know was painted on the day of his attempt suicide, uh, June 27, 1890. It was only late in the 20th century that this work was given this straightforward title, based on the similarity of its depiction to an 8082 Hague drawing uh, that Van Gogh had called La Racine, The Roots. Depicted, he wrote to Theo at the time, are three roots in sandy ground. In this particular motive, he found something of life struggle, uh, and referring to the roots, he defined the struggle as follows, frenetically and fervently rooting itself, as it were, in the earth, and yet being half torn up by the storm. All of this has already been chronicled in, in, the, in the literature, but there's, no, there's more to say about it. The interpretation deepens if we know that Vincent informed Theo in 1982 that this tree struggle takes place in sand, that is, infertile soil with also little to hold on. 
The gravity of the struggle is thus part of the narrative, and this also applies to his uh, three roots uh, of, of uh, uh, his stay in, in, in Auvergne, which depicts Coppet's tree on a rocky slope of a limestone soil uh, in that place. This is more fertile than sandy soil, but hardly holds any water, while at the same time it's more difficult for roots to settle in such soil. Life struggle uh, of the pseudo acacia depicted here um, was thus uh, as grave as that of the, the tree species in, in La Racine of 1882. However, this is not all. In 1882, Van Gogh sent Theo another drawing, now lost, with the same motive, uh, with the title, A Root in a Dry Ground. Probably sent again. According to the editors of Van Gogh's letters, this was a reference to Isaiah 53, verse 2, where the life of the Messias, uh, Messiah is being characterized, called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It therefore seems that Van Gogh wanted to symbolize in both works something of the existential, existential uh, suffering of humanity. And this information is of course especially relevant for his um, Three Roots of 1890, being the last painting and made on the day of his attempt to end his life. But neither title, to return at the issue at hand, gives the viewer any reason to consider such a thing. And so I submit to you the question whether we should not change the title to Life Struggle, Copped Three, three Truths on a Chalky Ground, or some variation of it. Perhaps you have other suggestions too. Again, titles are meant to, uh, to seduce the viewer into a desired interpretation of the work in question, and neutral descriptions are of no help. Most of his village views are in no way innocent neutral depictions of the related spot. The quest by Theo, Theo, uh, by Theo Medendorp and Wouter van der Vee for the spots depicted in Arl resulted paradoxically in the conclusion that the artist deliberately manipulated his imagery. In view of Auvergne's Oase, he made the village with uh, its towering church seem to rise as it were from a surrounding field of almost ripened wheat, but they discovered that these fields beyond the railway station contained no wheat at all. To give another example, Van Gogh found it necessary to cram the church into his representation of the Omenie's garden. But we know for sure that one cannot see that building from his chosen point of view. Here on the right. Van Gogh, in other words, captured in his landscape and village views not so much uh, Auvergne himself, but rather what had become a cliché since the first half of the 19th century. Namely, rural life according to the fixed ingredients of the regional novel the so-called Streekroman. To quote one of those books, the conscript from 1850 by Henry Conscience, which Van Gogh had made his own early on, the country, was the, the country was the region, and now I quote, where the soul forgets society and frees itself from its bounds with the figure of returning youth, where every thought takes on the form of prayer. There the exhausted man regains his useful strength. This is human life, to be born, to work, to love, to grow up, and to die." End of quote. Is in this dreamed countryside of the cycle of life and, and uh, in, uh, the, the cycle of life and death was not deterrent. The countryside offered a sheltered life and, cert and a certain kind of spirituality, hence his choice to depict the church in Auvergne so prominently. To put it in a nutshell, what he hoped to find in the surroundings of Sofer was La Foi du Carbonier, the so-called coal miners' faith. faith, the honest, naive faith of those whom the Bible calls the poor in spirit, because in their quest for a better life they had supposedly stripped themselves of all spiritual and social hindrances. Van Gogh believed in the existence of such so-called pure people, and although ideas different as who to belong to this elected group, it will be clear that Van Gogh was think thinking primarily of the poorest of the poor, which explains why in Auvergne he portrayed precisely their shabby, sometimes even dilap dilapidated homes. The more, the more primitive, the better. And in his painting from the Tate, he therefore reinforced the idea of the hamlets around uh, Auvergne as sheltered, almost cozy settlements by setting off the farmers' poor dwellings against the backdrop of varied cultivated fields, but much higher and steeper that is, than is typical of the region. 
In other villages, in, in, in other views, the farms with their straw, straw roofs seem to emerge from the earth, so to speak, as if they were uh, inextricable linked to it. Although this did not lead to paintings, he also showed an interest for the dwellings in the local quarries, which had fallen into disuse. But again, the title of the works uh, do not tie in with this narrative, uh, with the narrative suggested. The drawing was formally even booked in the literature as House and Fair. And again, should we not change those very neutral titles? titles? Uh, the sheltered dwellings of the poor, better? It's just a question. Van Gogh's choice for worn-out sub -like subjects like these, uh, dilapidated homes, was not exactly new for him, but it's notable that when it came to portraits, except for uh, his portrait of Dr. Cachet, he selected, above all, young girls. But please remember, vigorous youth, to quote conscience again, was an important ingredient of his uh, rural dream, and as nature was traditionally seen as feminine, it explains his choice for depicting young women rather than men, and rather than old men. He hoped in this way to renew himself as a person and, and patient, and this sense of vigorous spring, budding life, also prevails in several of his landscape, including the summer pieces from July. However, Van Gogh shamed his dream not only by falling back on what uh, was about to disappear from the village, namely the dwellings in the quarries, and the houses with straw roofs, but also thought about his hopes on what the future would bring, as shown in his Women Crossing the Fields, where the security of rural life is symbolized by a modern walled building and the wheat fields. Um, while apparently young village girls have already taken uh, on urban habits to judge by their clothing, a process that started as early as, as the 1870s, when Paris families started to spend their summer holidays in nearby villages such as Au Fair, and influenced the local girls in their clothing choices. It seems that Van Gogh tried in this way to modernize the more classical uh, uh, between art and nature by Pufie de Chauvin. So, so w w it, it seems to be the case that Van Gogh in this picture was trying to, uh, to modernize uh, uh, this picture by Pufie de Chauvin, which he had seen in Paris just before leaving in Auvergne. These changes in, in his iconography match the development in his painting style. Naturally, he built on uh, his old imagery, but he was much freer than ever before. Less uh, mimetic, more concise and compact in his compositions, one could say, with drawing and painting flowing seamlessly, that's what I want to show here, uh, drawing and painting flowing seamlessly, effortlessly together in, these, in his best works. Perhaps haste was involved, rushing from one subject to the other, but the change fits also seamlessly seam seam with his underlying uh, hope to renew himself in the countryside, not only as a patient, but also as an artist. Other than an Arl or Saint Remy, he no longer seems to care about, uh, about a too speedy execution, and contours lines are used in a rather uh, arbitrary way. Perhaps it is true to say that he was more electric, more varied in his, than in his previous years, jumping from one thing to the other. He could be joyf joyful uh, and playful with lies, uh, as can be seen here on the left, but also edgy and angular. Even so, his rather small study of flowering pseudo-Arcadias seems with its almost impressionistic application of loose colors areas an exception within his au fair uh, oeuvre, but that's trickery of sight, I think. Many of his paintings would look like this, but then we are talking about their first state only, before he balanced the composition by adding li lines at the, last morning, at the last moment, using them as uh, color uh, accents too. So, you can make your comparison. Uh, other new gimmicks were applied too, and let me give you only one example to round off my talk. Um, he had previously dared in portraits to stack the horizon line to the left and right of the motif, so the person in question here, for, for the sake of liveliness. But now he did the same in a landscape. Let me therefore end with my statement in the catalogue that he certainly was not burnt out as an artist. Quite the contrary, he took new paths, obeying his old artistic goal never to repeat himself, hoping for an art that 
really would make a difference. However, it was his self-chosen end that nipped his artistry in the bud. But I know that some of you think differently, so I'm looking forward to the discussion, but please remember, like the other members of our team, I am hard-headed. 